All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for, for this, what is it, fourth workshop of the day. We are so happy to be here and excited that you could join us uh, to hang out and talk and do a little bit of work with Dave Valdez. Uh, so Dave is a Cuban-American playwright and a writer. He lives in Boston, so he's our your neighbor local, uh, he is going to guide us through his process of writing a really interesting play that's been read and shown in Boston uh, a little while ago. And then we will also talk about meaning of narratives, how to create a narrative, and what is the role and meaning and power of narratives in integration. Um, I will hand it over to Dave to tell us more about himself and his story, and then we'll get going. Hello, it's lovely to see you. Uh, it sounds like you've had a lot going on this weekend, so I appreciate you coming out this afternoon. So uh, my name is David Valdez, and uh, as Marina said, I am a Cuban-American. My father is a Cuban exile, uh, and my mother is an American from uh, the Northeast. When I was a child, um, my brother and I uh, were the only what was then called Spanish kids uh, in our small town. Uh, there were no other um, immigrants and there were certainly no other, there were not just no other Cuban Americans, but there were no other uh, Hispanic or Latinx people uh, at that time. And uh, most of the time, I didn't think too much about it. You're a kid, what is, is. Uh, but, but there was a point where my father was in a car accident and uh, when the police uh, looked at his papers after the car accident, discovered that my father had not actually ever uh, finished the process to getting a green card or having the kind of paperwork that he needed. And it was a very disconcerting experience to suddenly, we had to prove that my father actually had been in the United States at that point for almost 20 years. Uh, we had to prove that he belonged here and that he was part of our family. And so everybody that knew my father was writing letters to attest to uh, that he was who he said he was, and that he belonged here. Um, that was the first time I think that I ever really processed um, that uh, refugees and exiles uh, and immigrants in some ways operated in different spaces than their neighbors here in the United States. Um, over the course of my life, it's a subject that I've thought a lot about, uh, and the Cuban identity has been a, a big part of my experience. But uh, a few years ago, uh, right around the time of the 2016 election, um, one of my students i have been teaching, I teach college at uh, Tufts University and at Boston Conservatory, and one of my students uh, came to me to tell me that um, his parents were undocumented and he was really struggling with how to be in college and still supporting them and they were across the country from him at that point. So we had started having some conversations and then the election happened and after the election three other students of mine came to me to tell me that they too were either themselves undocumented or their parents were. And talking to them during that time um, about their uncertainties and their fears and their worries uh, and then over the next the next that year and the next year as um, basically as other students heard that I was an okay professor to talk to about these things um, and talking to more of my students about their experiences I really uh, knew that I wanted to write about this and I wanted to write about it in a way that would tell more stories than we usually get the American narrative around what the refugee experiences and the immigrant experiences uh, tends to foreground the same stories over and over it tends to paint a particular, a particular picture of immigrants and refugees, um, including a literal picture in terms of who they must look like, what, what a refugee looks like, what they do, where they live. So I wanted to tell a story that was uh, more truthful um, and accurate to uh, a wider array of experiences. So I started, uh, first I started on my own doing some interviews and then I partnered up with Company One in Boston and they partnered up with the Boston Public Library System to reach out to community groups on a project at the time I was calling the Boston Undocumented Project. And how it worked is that I was interviewing undocumented immigrants um, or interviewing advocacy groups that worked with them who would then in turn hook me up with particular people or particular stories or steer me in particular directions. 
and doing a lot of listening to find out what stories they wanted to tell and what the stories were like in Boston. And while there are many cities in the US where um, the heavy, the heaviest populations of immigrants are from a particular place. Boston's immigrant populations are very diverse. Uh, they're very spread out. Um, while the media likes to tell uh, the stories of Mexican immigrants, of whom there are many, many thousands in the U.S., um, in Boston, it was really interesting that the um, largest numbers of immigrants weren't from Mexico um, at all, but from uh, Cambodia, China. Vietnam, Ireland, Central America, uh, Brazil, the Dominican Republic. So the more that I learned about uh, what was true about the Boston uh, immigrant population, the more and the more I talked to people, narratives began to form and I began to hear the things that, the stories that people wanted to tell. One of the things that I heard again and again was that uh, nobody was telling the stories, telling anything but the border crossing story or um, the deportation story. People were not telling the stories of the lives lived in the U.S., the contributions to neighbor neighborhoods, the contributions to cities and towns in the United States. Um, Agencia Alpha, which is an organization uh, that was founded here in Boston, when I met with them and the number of the immigrants they work with, one of the things they said is, Look, you know, look at the businesses that we're starting. Look at the things that we're doing. Tell about our joys as well. So as I interviewed it, I really began to think about that too. What were the other parts of the story? What were the excitements and joys at the heart of each person I interviewed, at, at the heart of their lives? And that became the through line for Downtown Crossing, which is the play that emerged from the Boston The Documented Project. Uh, Downtown Crossing will be premiering uh, digitally online with Company One at the end of this month. Um, a couple of things we had to factor in that, you know, um, is that people were telling their stories, they were sharing their stories, uh, while knowing that uh, the people in this specific project were all undocumented that I would be interviewing. So I had to be mindful about how to tell their stories, um, how to keep them safe. So in Downtown Crossing, um, there is no character that is entirely and only based on one story. They're all a little bit composite just for safety reasons and for masking reasons. Uh, but many of them are taken at heart from the, um, the ab, ab, you know, directly from the interviews with the people of Boston that I spoke to. And many of them um, have now read read the text, read or seen, you know, like Boston Public Library did a reading of it last year. Some of them felt safe enough to come to that. More of them are coming to um, the online reading of it because it is, it is safer for them. But um, over the course of interviewing, I, what I thought was really interesting was how much, when you listen to people tell their stories, stories are personal. The best stories are full of detail, about one person's life and one person's experience. The universal elements bounce off that. The things that other people can then say, oh yeah, I recognize that, come from the fact that they're hearing a story that is true. The more truthful you are in detail, the more specific you are in detail, the more that other people um, recognize the truth of it. And there's some trick in which when you believe something is true, then you are able to find yourself in it, even if your own experience is very different in some ways. So as I, as I spoke to people in the different communities, um, you know, I, for instance, um, you know, the uh, Nigerian American college student um, that I interviewed, uh, our families in many ways are nothing alike, our backstory is nothing alike, we don't speak alike, we're, you know, 40 years apart in age, just about, I might be exaggerating a little, um, and yet, I recognized my relationship with my mother, my relationship with my father. I recognized uh, the way that for the, he was always code switching. He was making adjustments so that he could speak to people in the voice that they wanted in a given setting, which is something I was doing all the time as a child. My father lived in Little Havana in Miami. My mother lived um, in a small town in Maine. So I was all the time either only with all white rural people or very cosmopolitan Cubans. 
when I was with people. And so I had to adjust my language to speak to them. Adding on top of that, the fact that my family was evangelical. I knew that I was gay. I grew up on welfare. I was the first person in my family to go to college. It was all code switching all the time. So initially, I didn't think I had a whole lot in common with this Nigerian American kid. And in fact, hearing his story, I understand, I understood, I know where I enter there. I know how to find my way into that story and how to, I, I know what I feel from that. And that's really what you're going for when you're thinking about storytelling. Let's, let's just talk for a minute about what storytelling does. Why tell stories? Um, throw into, if you have any thoughts, like what you like about a story or um, why tell a story, feel free to throw that into, into, into the chat. Um, you may have heard of the author Haim Potok. He wrote The Chosen and The Promise, My Name is Asha Lev. When I was a college student, I had the good fortune and weird fortune really, because I went to a tiny college in nowhere, uh, of being able to interview um, Haim Potok, uh, Haim Potok. And he said that all stories are the same thing, that every narrative is the same thing. It is when one human comes in contact with another human and when they come out on the other side of that interaction, slightly changed. Whether it is huge or whether it is grand, the interaction of those two humans changes them. And I thought that was a great way to look at storytelling. And especially when you are still storytelling about a topic that is deeply important to you, such as the refugee experience, such as trying to help people find a way into an experience of yours that is not their own, that notion is so powerful. How does our contact yield change? Let's see what we have in the chat. Storytelling is the connection to ourselves. Absolutely, one of the reasons we tell stories isn't just for others, right? We tell stories because we are processing our lives. We tell stories to connect to ourselves, connect others to ourselves, but also to better understand ourselves. Uh, storytelling builds empathy and understanding. Absolutely, that's the goal. And you know, really, truly, um, you know, obviously, there are stories that are told purely for entertainment. There are stories that are told, you know, just to amuse and delight. But really, at heart, most stories are saying, "Do you see? Do you see now? Can you hear me?" Um, I like to call it clicking the light on. You tell a story to make that light click on for somebody else. I'm going to read you one of the monologues from Downtown Crossing uh, to give you a little sense of the work that came out of this, of this project, but also so that you'll have that in the back of your mind when I lead you through some exercises on how you could tell your story, how you could make a story. So um, for this story, uh, the character is named Eleanor. Um, the details come from actually several different interviews, um, a lot of them from one particular person, but from multiple interviews about the experience of being um, almost retirement age as a Chinese immigrant. So somebody uh, who had lived in the United States for, uh, at this point, 40 years. Uh, so I'm just gonna read that to you now. Mr. 23 didn't come to May Fun this week, not last week either. I worry about Mr. 23 because he's old like me. Do you know how old? I know you don't. Old, old. I go to work Tuesday through Sunday. May Fun is closed on Monday. I am the oldest person there, and I'm never late, and I never complain. Ling says I complain all the time. Maybe. Never in English. Mr. 23 is never late either. Number 23 on the menu is Chinese eggplant with garlic. It has only one chili next to it on the paper, but Mr. 23 likes it to be too chilly hot. He used to ask every time he called, but now we know. I hand him the bag and say, too chilly. And he says, too chilly. And it's nice, a tradition. Since 1993, 10 years less, 10 years less th than me, 10 years more than Charles and Lang on May Fun. I'm older than everyone. Charles and Ling bought everything from the Lu's who were there one Sunday and gone on Tuesday. When I show up, they say they have a new team, all new, all from New York, and they shoo me away. 
and I sat down in the kitchen and said, my van to Boston will not come back till after dark. They worked around me all day long, and all day long they have to ask me where things are. When Mr. 23 comes in, he doesn't like the girl at the counter and the waiter and the bus boys are new. He got very upset. I come out from the kitchen and say, too chilly. And I wasn't fired anymore. He hasn't been to May Fun in two weeks. I have a name and address and phone number, but I don't call. I don't speak English much. You are surprised, yes? And what would I say? You sick? You dying? I have never used his name. Mr. 23 always came alone. Number 23, two chili, large white rice, and crab rangoon, which are disgusting and make no sense. I always put one cookie in the bag, not two, because I don't want him sad. Now who knows if he is sick or not sick? Who's worrying if he is sad? When you're alone, who cares? Uh, she starts doing Tai Chi moves. I don't know how to do Tai Chi, so I'll just do this to indicate it. This is good. When I was a girl in Fujian, I saw old people in the park do Tai Chi in the morning. I thought they moved so slow because they were old. I was an impatient girl. I would never be slow. I'm still impatient, but now I am also slow. I do Tai Chi, but not in the park, at the senior center. My room is just block, three blocks from the center. Sometimes the center has fish fillet with black bean, which is my favorite, but this week it is Wednesday and I'm never at my room on Wednesday. Tuesday through Saturday nights, I sleep at May Fun. No, not in the restaurant, in the house where the workers stay. There are 10 of us, two chefs who have their own room, four women like me in one room, and four men in another, two from El Salvador. I feel bad because they can only speak to each other and they have to wash dishes after the, they bust tables, but I don't like their music. So I'm glad men and women have separate rooms. I ride a van from Boston, which stops in three towns with Chinese restaurants. And then I walk to make fun. I go Tuesday morning to start chopping vegetables and peeling shrimp and potatoes and folding wonton and wrapping silverware and napkins before open. And I stay until after Sunday buffet special. I get to sleep in my own room Sunday and Monday nights, and I like those nights best. I have my tea and my, neighbors, and my neighbor brings me buns, and I can talk to Fang, my husband. You surprised again? Fang is not there. Fang died in 1997. Before that, I worked sewing and he packed tubes in a factory. Chinatown was our whole world. Our friends were here, all our foods, our remedies. Sometimes we'd go to the concerts downtown, a big treat. We would walk because Pang was sure police would be on the train. I always said, nobody's going to bother us. We were respectable, but we walked, even when it was cold. I don't think he liked all the signs in English on the subway, and the speaker's voice was confusing. I always bought the ticket because my English was better than his. Mostly, I just pointed. It was okay. We didn't know what the conductor was saying, but that was okay, too. Music was Pong's favorite thing. I would rather go to movies, but it was nice. And we liked our room. When Pong died, I kept the room, but I couldn't afford it. I knew ladies who went to other towns for restaurants, and they had more money. Instead of pennies per piece, they got $1,000 a month. A thousand. At that time, this was like saying, I won the lottery every time. It's even more now. May Fun pays $2,000 a month, as long as I get in 72 hours each week. That's $8 an hour. I don't know how to do anything else that pays so much. Boston is expensive. Old landlord sold the building and my room costs more. New landlord said they weren't forcing us out, but now my $600 room is $1,200. The heat stopped working and the new man says he's in no hurry because he can get real money for rooms with heat. He thinks I will move. But Pong's clothes are here and my neighbor who brings me buns and I am only a few blocks from the center. I have been here longer than the new guy. He will learn or maybe I will die. I am old, old. When the Lu's got old, they retired. That's what Ling said, they retired. In America, you stop working one day. I am more old than the Lu's. I asked Ling how to retire. She said to ask someone whose job this was. Paying me was her job, not taking care of me. I am not her grandmother. She likes me more than she says, but a boss can only be so nice. I went to a lawyer, pretty, young like a neighbor's grandchild and already a lawyer. Her Mandarin was very good for someone with an American accent. I asked her 
how do I get my old money? I say old money, the English words are harder to say. Social security. When I first started working for the Lou's and they take money from my pay, I was mad. But Miss Lou told me they had to. They gave me a number that let me get paid, but everyone with a number had to give money to this social security, which was money you get back when you get old. So I have paid my taxes and my old money since 1997. It must be a lot now. I said to the lawyer who uses her Chinese name, even though she's in America, how do I get my old money? She didn't know what I meant at first. So I said, when I retire, how do I get my money back? You know what she said. You know. I can get help at the hospital if I am very, very sick and free and help at the free clinic if I am only very sick. I can eat at soup kitchens. I can visit senior center every day. If I can't pay for my room, if I can't, This is good. This is good. When I get my check from May Fund, $2,000 is $1,728 minus the house fee, so $1,600. After my rent, I have $400. I eat once a day, the free meal at the end of the day at May Fund, Tuesday to Saturday. So I only need to buy food Sunday and Monday, eight days a month. That is maybe $90. My prescription from the clinic for hypertension is $14 with my coupon. Lights and gas for cooking is 90. Laundry is 16, all quarters. My phone is cheap as plan, $60. $130 left for everything else. But I don't need much. Soap, shampoo, herbs, aspirin. If I save $100 every paycheck in one year, I can save a whole month's rent. 12 years, and I could quit my job and retire for a year. And I can die. My friend, my friend who brings the bun, she retired from a factory. They gave her a money tree. Everyone put dollar on the tree and all for her. They make a cake with her name and she brings me a piece. So much frosting. What do I want retiring anyway? More time in my room? Everyone but my neighbor who brings me buns has moved from the building. My street is full of young people, rich people. I'm close to the center, but Mondays are enough. Sometimes fish fillet with black beans is on Monday, and that's good. When I work, I make people happy. There's a family who comes every Sunday for buffet, and I watch their kids grow up. Nice kids, but not the youngest. He's spoiled. There's a young couple who know my name, and they say they love my smile. Miss Eleanor, they say, because they are from the South and they are polite to elders, not like Boston. And I say, how you like your food, good? The answer is always good. And there's Mr. 823. I hope he's okay. I hope he comes back. I will be there when he does. So this story about Eleanor is full of lots and lots and lots of details. Little things sprinkled along the way to help you understand Eleanor, to help you understand her world, but also to see what she's thinking about and wrestling with. And Mr. A23's story, which she's telling, is of course a way of telling her own story. So let's talk about what goes into a story and how you can tell some stories too. I'm going to share my screen with you, and I'm going to talk to you about what I call the narrative trio. I made the term up, so if you run around saying to your friends, oh, you know the narrative trio, uh, your friends may not know what you're talking about. But these are the three things that I, that I believe go into every single story. 
This is how you tell a story. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. I've put the components on the screen and you could write these down or if you watch the video later, you could uh, write them down then. But this is what I say. Every story has three components, character, conflict, and motion. So think about what Haim Potok said. Two people come together, so a, a human encounters another human that is not them. And when they come out on the other side of that, they are slightly changed. So let's look at each of these elements. First is character. Character refers to the person whose journey we're following. So if you're writing your own story, that's you. But you could also apply this to a story about a parent or a child or someone you knew. But if let's say uh, that you're writing about yourself, we need to know what you as a character value, need, fear, or desire when the story starts. So stories always start somewhere. And it may not, and they, they don't often start with a bang, right? Stories quite often start with somebody just living their lives. The starting point is before the fireworks in many cases. So the character, we have to be thinking about whether it's you or somebody else, what does that person value? What is it they need? What is it they fear? Or what do they desire? And those are all different things. So you, you want to think about what is it that your character is actually feeling? What's the driving feeling, the driving emotion at the time that we meet them? And before you can move on to the other elements, you also want to be thinking, you also want to be painting a picture of who they are, their context, their behaviors, their personality, their history. So let's say um, somebody type into the chat. Actually, if somebody types into the chat, I don't know if I'll see it while I'm screen sharing. Um, so somebody type into the chat. For you, Dave, if that helps. Yes, if you could. So somebody type in, um, thinking about the refugee experience or your own experience, type in um, a value, a need, a fear, or a desire. And then if someone could read what comes up. We have a better future, finding a sense of home, safety, having a place to belong, fear of being out of place. Great. Right, so all of those, any of those feelings, some of which overlap and dovetail, any of those would be a great, a great emotion for a character to be invested with at the start of the story. Right, so somebody, let's say somebody is wanting to make a home in a new place, right? So they've come to this new place, they moved to a new town, and they're wanting to really make a home of this town. So that would be enough um, as the core desire for a character. But we have to know more than their, their desires. We have to know their context. So at some point in the story, we under, need to understand where were they from? Where were they before this? If their desire is to make a new home of this town, what town were they in before? Or country? Or state? Where were they before? What's the context? Why did they leave that place for this place? For you to really be able to bring the character to life, you have to think about their behaviors. So for Eleanor, whenever things get too unnerving, whenever she's facing an uncomfortable truth, she immediately calms herself down with the movement, right? That's where she breathes out. We also learn in terms of uh, Eleanor, her personality. So think about your character's personality. Think about the number of times where Eleanor says something and then waits and then is like, no, 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 I'm lying, right? Like I'm kidding. They say, I, you know, I tell you that I never, I never complain. Well, actually, I complain all the time, right? You get these like little winks from Eleanor. That's her personality. She has that character and their history. So you want to be thinking about everything that you can know about the character, including if it doesn't go in your story. So you're thinking about all of the things that help you really think about your character in real ways 
And then you're going to choose which ones do show up in the story. But you have to really think of your, your character as a round person with lots going on and not just their fear or their need or their desire. So that's character. The second one is conflict. Conflict is something that challenges or complicates the value, need, fear, or desire that we've already established. So if somebody is wanting to make a better home in this new town, they're really like longing for home in this town, what could be the conflict? Type in some possible conflicts. Obligations to family, people from the town lacking interest in the newcomer, being accepted for who you are, not integrating into local community, economic barriers, language barriers, not finding work. Yeah, those are great. And they all represent different kinds of conflicts, which is interesting. Because conflict, conflict can be negative or positive, but it will change how the person is reacting, right? The conflict is the thing that they are spending the story responding to or trying to deal with. And the, the things that came up in the chat there represent different kinds of conflict. So if it's within your own family, so their own family, they're, they're in conflict with what their family wants or feels or whether their family is on the same page with them about this town. But that's, that's a conflict in their own house. But somebody else mentioned the conflict from outside the house, that the neighbors are not interested in bringing in new people or drawing in new people. Economics, right? Circumstance can be the conflict. That a person, even with um, the support of their family or welcome from their neighbors, that their economic circumstances, that other circumstances, it could be physical health circumstances, are the thing that complicates their desire. Um, Eleanor uh, has the conflict of uh, the fact that she was, she's tired, she would like to retire. She had believed for a long time that the money that she keeps paying in at work will come back to her. Uh, and she needs the money because the economic pressure of living in Chinatown as it gentrifies and as the buildings get more and more expensive, the economic reality is pushing her to need to have that money. That's a conflict for her. And so she has to try and solve that conflict. So you notice here, I list different kinds of conflicts. Conflicts can be internal. It isn't always between the person and someone else. The conflicts can be inside a person, between one's own feelings, values, wants, needs, desires, right? So it may be that you desire a, a sense of home in this place, but you want to go back to your family. You value your family, but you desire to change your lifestyle. So your conflict could be internal. The conflicts can be external as we mentioned, between them and others, whether the conflict is with one person or many people or a whole society. So let's look at motion. And this is what makes a story a story. When you hear people say, you know, when, when you ask people what's, what are the three building blocks of the story, everybody always says the same thing, beginning, middle, end, right? You can't have, an, the end has to end somewhere. Something has to have happened. And for me, what needs to happen for something to be a story is motion. Motion is the change that occurs because of how character, the character handles the conflict or the impact of the conflict on their character. So your character, um, the person that wanted a sense of home in this town, and let's say they bump up against resistance from their family and their neighbors, they are spending the story trying to solve that problem. And something changes at the other end. Maybe they solve it successfully. Maybe they are able to actually draw both their family and their neighbors into supporting them. And they find a new role for themselves in the town. Perhaps they've created a new role for themselves in the town as the person who is the only one who has a particular skill. And they solve this problem and how they are changed on the other side. The motion for them is they realize that the making of that change had to be on them, that the making of a home would not come from the family in the town, 
but what they chose to do. But it could be that a person doesn't get what they wish, that the conflict actually doesn't get resolved in that way. And so you get to the other end, and the change is that they no longer believe they can have the original wish. Or maybe they no longer desire the original wish. Or maybe they discover that the original wish was never the point, that the point was really they needed to be standing up for themselves to their family. Right, so change can be large or small. The character can't remain fully the same as when we first met them. Motion can also be for the audience, a change that the storyteller desires of the listener after they have heard the story. And I think all the best stories do this intentionally. This is where I talk about the light clicking on. Most good stories are not just showing change, but causing change. They're making the listener see slightly differently, see something new. And that becomes especially powerful and impactful when you are telling stories about groups that are marginalized, groups that are not in the majority, uh, groups that are misrepresented and misunderstood in the media. The ability to tell a story in a way that click, the light goes on, is really, is really powerful. So you put those things together, a character wrestles with a conflict and yields motion, and that's storytelling, that's a narrative. As I said earlier though, there is one more element that I wanna throw in here. Uh, oh, so like if you do this as an algebra formula, this is as much math as I do. A character who wants values, fears, desires X discovers Y, and this leads them to Z. That's algebra by date, right? That's as good as it gets. But my last note, be specific and truthful in choosing details to include. The more concrete you are, the more the truth comes out. And when an audience senses the truth, the more likely they are to find resonances with their own truths. Think about the Eleanor story for a moment. What are, just quickly, popcorn, what are details that you can remember from that story? You're not gonna remember everything from that story, but what images can you see in your head even though you've never met Eleanor? $16 of coins of laundry. $16 worth of quarters, yep. Her thoughts about Mr. 23. Mr. A23, yeah, absolutely, Mr. 23. Uh, that was one of those things that just really stuck with me long after that interview, which is now two years ago, was the fact that he knew customers by their order numbers and she had a yeah. favorite, right? Those little details help ground it in a real world, right? They really help you. So you want to be thinking about that yourself. All right, I've done a lot of talking. So I'm going to give you a walkthrough on how you could plan to tell a story, how you could turn something into a narrative, whether you turn it into a written story, like, you know, I write books as well as plays. So if you turn it into fiction or creative nonfiction or if you do it as a play, if you did it as a monologue, it's all the same thing. It's all the same ideas that you're working with. So uh, for this exercise, I'm going to give you a prompt, and I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think here at first. Um, I don't, I, because I'm sharing my screen, I can't see how many of you are blacked out your screens, but feel free to black out your screens if you, you know, if you haven't already and you want time to be working here. But we're going to do an exercise in planning a narrative. So today's prompt Choose a moment in your life where you realized that things were about to change or had changed already. Or choose a moment in your life you made a big decision that would change you. So take a moment and think about what you'd like to write. Just take a moment. All right, so when you have that in mind, once you know what moment you want to write about, remember your choices are a moment when you realize things are about to change, a moment when you realize things had changed, or a moment when you made a decision that would change you. 
So when you have that in mind, your first step, I'm gonna have you close your eyes right now. I'm not gonna have you write anything, just close your eyes. I want you to step back and look at yourself like a stranger. So think about that moment in time that you have chosen, whenever that was, and I want you to be a good 10 feet away looking at that you. You need to be able to look at yourself like a stranger. Look at the top of your head, look at your hair. Are you wearing a hat? Look at your eyes. Do they look, what emotion can we see in your eyes? Are they open? Are they closed? Are they worried? Are they happy? Are they electric? Are they excited? Are they angry? Are they tired? Look at the expression on your face. What do we notice about your face? Are there features that stand out? Is there something about how your face is resting? Look at your shoulders. Are they up? Are they down? Are they back? Are they relaxed? Are your arms at your sides? Are they crossed in front of you? How are you standing? Are you standing firmly with your feet planted apart? Are your feet close together? Do you shift your weight to one side? Have your character turn around and walk away from you for a moment. How do you walk? Is there a bounce in your step? Are your steps heavy? Are they tiny little steps? Are they strides? Are they nervous? Have that you turn and face you one more time. What are you wearing? What do your clothes tell us about you? How do you wear your clothes? Are they new? Are they old? Do they fit? Is it something favorite and well-loved? Is it something new and fresh? Look your character in the eye for a minute. Just look. Open your eyes. With that in mind, jot down three or four of the most important details from what you just pictured. It could be anything. It could be an item of clothing that you're like, oh man, I pictured her in that sweater. Or it could be, oh my gosh, my eyes looked so sad. Maybe it was um, arms folded. Why were my arms crossed? Maybe it was that terrible, terrible haircut that uh, you were embarrassed by. So write down a few of the details that are important for you to see that time, the you of that moment. I'll give you just a minute. All right, so the second part of the exercise is thinking about that you, make a sentence that answers this question, or that says it this way, my greatest need, fear, value, or desire at that moment was blank. So think about you in that moment, and you can choose one of these, need, fear, value, or desire, or you could answer it for a couple of them. My greatest need, fear, value, or desire at that moment was blank. All right, number three, could others tell number two? Meaning, could other people tell what your greatest need, fear, value, or desire was? If your answer is yes, 
Yes, other people could tell. How so? Write down ways that other people knew, why other people knew, how other people knew. If people couldn't tell, how would somebody looking back on it now know? Like, how was this clear in other ways in your behavior? Right, so could others tell? If so, how could they tell? I think it's interesting, and I don't know if you're answering this one, but I think so. Uh, buns from the neighbor. The neighbor knew Eleanor was worried about food. The neighbor knew Eleanor was short on money. Right, so that they brought the buns, that was great. Uh, if they could not tell, so if somebody didn't know, if your greatest fear, if your greatest need was to have new friends, but other people couldn't tell, how is this clear in other ways in your behavior? So an answer to something like that, like if your ne greatest need was for new friends, but everybody thought you were so independent, maybe it became clear in other ways, such as the fact that you hosted three different potlucks and chaired four different groups, committees in your town, right? So if people could tell how, and if they couldn't tell, how is it clear in other ways? So take a minute or two to try and answer that. So now we've thought about our character. We have some visual details. We know what our character wants. And we're now looking at our character from outside, right? We've seen how other people are looking at that character. So now let's talk about the, the moment that things changed. Picture the moment you knew things were going to change. Thank God you know, that you can edit Word and I can do it live here. Picture the moment you knew things were going to change or if you did the prompt as the moment that you decided to change things, et cetera. What happened in that moment, right in that moment, right? If I said that this was a moment that you had chosen, what happened right in that moment? And I say, be concrete. What details do you remember from the physical moment? So by be concrete, being concrete means not just saying I was, I felt, I thought, but actually thinking about how that played out. If you say, I was so mad, that doesn't mean very much. If you say, I slammed the door to my room so hard the picture came off the wall and shattered on the floor, that gives us a much more concrete picture of mad. That tells us how mad you were, right? So picture the moment you knew things were gonna change, be concrete, what happened? Are there sounds that you were hearing in that moment? Was there somebody speaking to you? Were there other people around you? Uh, did your temperature change? Did you say or do something? So take, uh, take a little bit longer, take like two minutes and really write down as many things as you can remember from that moment. Take another 30 seconds or so.
All right, so that was what was happening physically, concretely around you. Now let's look in, at the internal piece. Describe your thoughts and emotions in that moment. Internal dialogue can help. So you can describe your feelings, you can list your feelings, that's fine, absolutely. You could make images out of what your feelings felt like. You felt um, like a tidal wave of embarrassment. You can say that, right? You can put language that way. But also internal dialogue can help. You can say what was what you were thinking. Why is nobody listening to me right now? Um, my mother can't possibly say that to me after all she's done, right? The things that were in your head in that moment. So we'll take two more minutes and have you describe your thoughts and emotions and perhaps an internal dialogue. Try to wrap up. So we're gonna leave the moment of change uh, for a little bit. What was the moment for Eleanor, by the way? Buried within that story, do you know what I think of as the moment in that story? And it's a big ask, you just heard it the one time. So the moment for Eleanor was the moment with the lawyer when the lawyer doesn't know what old money is and has to tell her, no, you don't get yours back. So think about all the things that like we learned about Eleanor around that, but the actual moment was her realization, oh no, I don't have that, right? That's her moment. So the next one is go back and describe yourself a day or week or year before that moment. What was different about you? What did you think or believe? Sort of up to you how far back, how close or far back you wanna go, but you don't, you wanna take a moment to step outside yourself and to look at who you were before that moment. What would be different? What would look different? whether it's internal or external. So take a minute and jot down some notes about the person you were at some point well before that moment. And now we're going to play with time again and go the other direction. Well, actually, we're going to go, we're going to go back to the moment, but just barely. So the next step, flash ahead to just after the moment of realization of change. And you don't have to write a lot here, but so here you've had the moment of change. You've got the voices in your head, you've, you've got, you've paid attention to the world around you. What did you do next? So just after that moment, 
How did you feel? What did you do next? Were you scared? Were you thrilled? Were you terrified? Were you anxious? Were you angry? Did you leave the setting that you were in? Did you say something? Did you do something? So right after the moment of realization, how did you feel? What did you do next? We'll take just a minute for this. Take about 30 seconds. All right, so now we're going to leap forward. So you're going to look at a long time after that moment, maybe a year. Definitely don't choose a week later. Don't choose two weeks later. Leap ahead. So let's say a year later or years later, five years later. But you want to be well past that moment, enough that you are truly a new self. What were you like then in that future time? And how were you different than in the moment of change? Be concrete. So leap to that time, think about what's different, how you can see it. Do you move differently? Do you dress differently? Do you talk differently? Do you live differently? Are you in a different place? Is your body language different? Is your attitude different? Are these big changes or small changes? But they are changes that come from being on the other side of that moment. And one way to think about the difference, to frame the difference, is not just physical, but to look back at the original want, value, near, want, value, need, or fear, and ask yourself, what does that person want, value, need, or fear now? And I'm actually going to put that right on the screen. Now you can see my terrible typing. Whoa. All right, so the last thing I'm going to say about this, so you've done the exercise, you've done, and this is a starter exercise, right? It didn't, it isn't itself like a step-by-step, -step, this is a story in order. This is an exercise to give you a bunch of tools, a bunch of notes to think about what you want to put in a story, what could go in a story. You can take any of these and just do a free write, write everything that comes to your mind, and then go back afterwards and just highlight the things that stick out at you. The Mr. A23 the the money tree the the buns from the neighbor whatever right take the things that leap out at you like oh i really want that in my story highlight those things so that you remember that those will go into the story you tell but with all these tools you do have a whole story the elements of who you were what changed you and who you became now when you think about putting together the story in terms of how to tell it you can arrange the elements either in linear order which is this, 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 this. 
So time only moving forward, just exactly in the order it happened. You can absolutely tell a story that way. Or you can move back and forth in time, keeping the intended motion in mind. So you might decide to start the story in the middle. I could have started Eleanor's story um, at the uh, office of the lawyer and then leapt back in time and worked forward to explain why she was there. I could have started the Eleanor story at the beginning, which would be in Chinatown with Pong when she worked uh, sewing and he was at the factory and worked forward through time. I chose to tell the story from the ending because if you think about it, the first thing that you hear is Mr. A23 hasn't been to May Fun recently, which is actually from the present. So I started there, but I knew what I had to show over the course of the story by the time we got back to that detail. So you can actually move the pieces around and tell your story in any order, as long as you're always able to say, character A believed uh, valued X, but Y happened and Z was the result, right? As long as you are on track or are always able to think about what's that motion, you can order the story in any, any direction. All right, you can shake your hands out now if you did a lot of note taking during that. Um, and that's, that's all I have for you. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, about any of it, about writing, about storytelling, um, about uh, gay Cuban American welfare babies, um, whatever, whatever you like. But we have some time here. Um, I think we'll probably be wrapping up a little bit early. Uh, it's been a long day for everyone. But um, if you have questions, ask away. I'm game. And I can see the chat now. I have a quick question. And uh, first, thank you so much for this exercise. I think that I, I you know, I'm a more a musician, so I never took time to actually write. Like I'm more like on the composition side. So it's like very interesting to see how one react to uh, writing uh, direction. So uh, my question is, um, when you were working on the piece downtown crossing so did you do this type of exercise with the different uh participants like the different uh people who uh... uh sometimes uh so the boston public library gave us a couple of um number of times they set us up in branch in a branch in branches right um like we went out to jp um so they set us up with spaces in the branches um, and we invited people to come um, and uh, do this work. So we did that a couple of times. Um, when I was interviewing people one-on-one, -on -one, I did not. Um, what I, I, I sort of, I kind of did it for them in a way, right? I would, you know, I would let people, for one thing, I would let people just spool out their stories because if you, if you let people start talking, you'll start to hear the things that actually come to their heart first. Um, and I would try to follow down those. But when something would, would catch, like um, I interviewed um, an undocumented woman who uh, had made marathon running in the US kind of her mental space. It was the thing that she did to, for peace and like for her own self, like, um, like for self-esteem and pride, it was this real important thing to her. And she was at the Boston Marathon bombing. And so when she mentioned that, then I started asking some of these questions, right? I started following down these avenues to get details about um, what that was like, what it was like, what it was like before, what it was like to run the race again later, what it meant to her, and that led to other things. Are there things that you that you have found hard about writing, or um, found challenging that make it hard for you to tell stories or to know how to get started in writing? I have one question for you, Dave. That's actually so. Yeah, I think I. Um, I found it a little challenging to start because I was overthinking, but then as we were going, I think it was, it was easier and I was really into it. So thank you so much for giving us this task. 
Um, but I was wondering if you can share a little bit of a process. So you wrote a play um, based on these interviews about, with the undocumented um, people, and then your, your characters are composites, as you call them. So they are pieces of different people, right? So how, how did that process look in, a for, in this you know, context, and how, how did that development of a story go for you? Did you kind of base it on one character and then steal from the other, or how, how did that work? So um, in large part, yes. In large part, each character is heavily based on one person. Um, and I originally thought that I would that that's how it would work, but I heard a number of times from people saying, play with the details, mask things, like don't make it too easy to peg one person. Uh, so there, there are sort of various degrees. There is, there is a pair of women, um, uh, an El Salvadoran and uh, uh, Honduran woman in um, in the play uh, who uh, I'm sorry, no El Salvadoran and Guatemalan woman in the play who are friends uh, and kind of finish each other's sentences that were really three women, um, and I used the core stories of two of those three women, but the dynamic of how they talk to each other and interact was really taken from the way the three of them interacted, for instance. Um, there were there were characters that are pretty pretty heavily one person, um, and I imported a major detail or a misleading detail in from other interviewees, really just for their safety, right? So the emotional stories, the emotional story in every case really comes from one person's story. Uh, some of the factual details are are made composite for those reasons. Mm -hmm. I wonder then, um, you know, because we talked a lot about integration and advocacy over the weekend and sort of how do we use stories to, um, you know, either how people use stories to preserve their own identity and culture and connection to home or to share it with others or to build a new home wherever they are. And I guess we didn't talk really about the undocumented um, people at all. So I was wondering, what can you tell us about sort of this experience of trying to tell a story while at the same time hiding the people behind them because you have to protect them. And how do we kind of, how do we use stories in these situations to advocate for them? Is it, is it the place for art to do this? And yeah. It, you actually do it the same way, however, because the, the thing is all of the details in the stories that are told are true, right? One of the things that was really important was to be as accurate and specific to what these experiences are. Um, and so people at the reading at the Boston Public Library last summer, um, so many people afterwards kept saying, I didn't know, I didn't know. They hadn't pictured what daily life was like. They hadn't thought about a bunch of the small details. A lot of people were just shocked that an Irish guy was worried about being deported. Um, and they had never stopped to think about what it might, what it might look like for him to be undocumented. Um, and so there are just very real, specific, concrete details that are still doing this advocacy. They're telling people, see differently, think differently. Um, and you know, for one of the one of the characters is starting her own business and invites the audience to go to her business opening. And you find out how she started her business and it's really impressive and exciting. And you see her also being a real saleswoman. She's always, she's always saying the opening's May 1st and her friend is like, it never ends. Um, because the, the, this was from this group of women that I interviewed together. Uh, they're like, tell people about our businesses, right? Like people have no idea that we're like accomplished and you know, she had been like very, like this particular person had, you know, had, you know, a very high powered position in her home country. And it's like, people are surprised that we know how to do marketing or that we can run a business, right? Like, that's crazy. So it's still doing the same thing, even though I was masking people, individuals, what's coming out are these pictures that are, are missing, but they're true pictures. Uh I think someone has a question. Do you want to go ahead? Um, yes, I have a question. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for um, sharing your um, process with us and for sharing that very inspiring, beautiful story. Um, I um, One of the um, 
the students you mentioned earlier, I, it resonated with me so well because I'm also a Nigerian immigrant. And, um, you know, when I first came to America, it was very difficult for me to fit in. And I still find my accent changing depending on who I'm talking to. So you sharing that was just so, I felt like, you know, you were talking about me. Um, so my question for you is, I am also a writer. I, um, you know, try to write short stories and I struggle with the fact that um, I like to put a lot of pressure on myself and I expect everything I do to be perfect. And obviously with writing, when you start out, it is going to be so far from perfect. And, um, you know, when I start out the process and things aren't looking the way I want them to be, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to leave this and not doing it, um, do it again. So what advice would you um, give to someone who suffers from the chronic need to be perfect all the time um, with the writing process? So basically separate out the words perfect and process from each other entirely, right? Process is all about getting stuff down, getting ideas down, beginning to find what you really want. If you start out at an end point, if you start out thinking, I needed to do this, Right? If you start out really fixed on it has to look like this, yeah, it can't be done. It just can't be done. So um, if you know that about yourself too, uh, think of giving yourself different tasks, right? Instead of I'm going to write the story, think uh, I'm going to write this one scene and give yourself a, a micro task. Uh, I, in this scene, I just have to like get the atmosphere expressed or uh, I, I need to write you know, one, one set of good dialogue that will help people hear my character's voice. Just give yourself a micro task and don't think beyond that at all. Um, every writer I know is also very superstitious. Um, every real writer, like people that really like, this is what they do all the time. They're so, we're all so superstitious and honor your superstition. So if you know that if you pause to read backward and proofread your text, you're going to make yourself crazy, then just never do that again. Uh, find out the spaces where you're most productive and not. Uh, so I'm sitting in my dining room. I have a, an office space theoretically in my house, but I can't write in it. So I know I can write at this table. There's a wall behind me, space open in front of me. There's a window to one side. That's my favorite way to write. If I go to a coffee shop and I have to sit in the middle of the room and there's nothing behind me, I will do something else. I'm not going to write because I can't. So Trust, trust your instincts, know the things that get in the way, and so don't do those things. But really do break things down into micro tasks, into small tasks. And also just know that even a first draft that you've put it all together and, and that you like and you're happy with, it's going to change anyway. Both for books and plays, it's so going to change, right? It's, it, an editor is going to have new feedback, or a director is going to have new feedback. It's just going to change. So just let that burden let that burden off. The things that you're passionate about are going to come through in your story. People are going to be drawn to those things. And the, the, the perfection, as much as it's ever going to come, will come later. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Yeah, Jeremiah, go ahead. I had a real quick question, and it's how do you create narratives with the three components you talked about when the characters are composites of a few different people. Well, that, yeah. So if, if you're doing that, you have to think about, you have to settle on something, right? So uh, that's why I say like for all of these, even though they're composites, there's somebody's story that really spoke to me that I really, I really followed at heart. And that's usually where I go. Um, so I usually follow, I usually follow that. I'm trying to think, um, who is least based on a single character in Downtown Crossing? Um, you know, there is a character that I chose one person's desire and gave her somebody else's outcome. Um, but before I wrote the character, I had to make that choice. I had to decide um, whether the person I was starting with, whether she was going to get the motion of her real life, and she did not. Um, but you know, you can also, you, you know, anything you learn, like uh, all of these things, you can be writing about real refugee experiences or real experiences of any kind as fiction. 
Um, so you could choose to do the same thing with a lot of truthful details in a way of showing the world truthfully and just make it fiction, in which case you're entirely controlling who your character and what their outcome is. But yeah, that's what I did for in this particular case. Does anyone else have a question? No. Um, Dave, I have one more question um, before we end. Um, I was wondering, given your personal story, you know, you are a writer, so what was the role of narrative in your life um, as also an immigrant or a child of immigrants yourself? And um, what can we sort of close off this discussion? Because we were also focusing on integration for the weekend. Uh, you know, what in your, in your experience and um, in your own thinking, what's the role of narrative and how, how can we use its power best? Well, so for me, narrative was present all the time, but immigrant narr narratives were absent all the time. I was never reading or seeing anything about my family's life. Never, ever. The first Cuban I saw in like a TV show or movie was Scarface. And it was Al Pacino. I, you know, it was like it was like no Cuban had been involved in the making of this film. Is what it felt like, right? There, it was such a strange, bizarre, fantastical representation that um, bore no resemblance to anything I recognized, and then became the American window into this is Cubans, right? Um, and so what I would say is that we need narratives. We need narratives about our lives. We need to make them, we need to support them, we need to get them out there. Because without people having access to narratives, they just don't know, right? Um, you know, and in some cases, that's even true for people who live in towns with immigrants, with refugees, with exiles. Um, if they are not actually interacting with and, and having meaningful exchanges with those people, they don't know, they don't see. The number of times I've had somebody say, oh, I didn't know. And I'm thinking quietly in my head, yes, I know. That's why all of my plays have Cuban Americans in them. That's why, right? We have to tell the stories. We have to. Thank you so much. Um, this has been such an inspiring um, hour and a half. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and chat. Um, thank you for having me.